Hi, I'm Jenny Shampo. I'm the director of the Book of Mormon Art Catalog, and we're joined today by Miranda Wilcox. Thank you for being here. Well, thanks so much, Jenny. Miranda is an associate professor of English at BYU, and she teaches wonderful and wacky medieval literature. <laughs> I want to know more about the wacky medieval literature. <laughs> She studies early medieval religious culture, particularly in England, and her research focuses on how religious communities construct identity using narratives, metaphors, and ritual discourses. And she also co-edits the Maxwell Institute's Living Faith book series, which I highly recommend. You're doing great work there. Thanks. Today we're looking at um, Helaman chapters 13 to 16, and the illustration we have comes from 1925. Um, this is an illustration of Samuel the Lamanite. It appeared in the Children's Friend magazine in 1925. And um, we, we have just the artist's initials here. In the lower left, it says HW. Uh, our, our friend, artist uh, Partial, has been doing some uh, historical research into who HW might be. Uh, and we've been looking into it also. And um, um, artist thinks it, it might be uh, a gentleman named Christian Nelson White, uh, who helped found a, a collective of artists, um, and that, that went by the, the collective name of HW. Um, but he, he seems to be the, the illustrator behind this piece, um, but this is still sort of a puzzle that, that we're piecing out. So um, this is, <laughs> this is ex an exciting new piece that we're looking at and, and an artist that we're not really familiar with, um, but fun to see um, how some of the early Latter-day Saints of the 20th century were thinking about Book of Mormon art. Um, so Miranda, first, can you just tell us a little bit about Samuel and what he's doing here in this piece? Um, so the, the picture is uh, associated with a two-page story in The Friend by Jeanette Bingham D, who is the librarian of the Primary General Board. And she was retelling um, the chapters, uh, Helaman 13 through 16. So she tells about how Zarahemla was a flourishing city. It was very beautiful. There were beautiful fields and things were going really well, but the people were very wicked. And here comes Samuel, uh, a stranger, um, as she points out, and a Lamanite. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then she quotes bits and pieces from Samuel's prophecies. Um, well, also telling the Nephites they needed to repent or they'd be destroyed, and then his prophecies about Jesus' birth and his death. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, that not everybody listened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Nephites right. did not all yeah. listen. <laughs> yeah. So. so I know most of us are probably familiar with the Arnold Freeberg depiction of Samuel the Lamanite on a really high wall. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this, this is an image you and I grew up with um, in our copies of the Book of Mormon, right? Um, kind of the iconic... Latter-day Saint image of Samuel the Lamanite. Um, how does this depiction compare or contrast with that one? Well, I think um, it's closer. I mean, you're, mm -hmm. the, the viewer is much closer to Samuel mm -hmm. and the wall and the people yeah. in Freiburg's, you know, have you this little teeny tiny Samuel way up on the very tip top of this very tall wall in red and his ropes building leaning out. And here we can actually see the face of Samuel. Yeah. Um, and he looks really similar. I, I mean, I'm not seeing some of the racialized yeah. differences that sometimes we get in Freiburg's work between mm -hmm. Lamanites and Nephites. Right. Here, Samuel has the full beard, uh, as do the men down in the lower half of the painting. Presumably, these are the inhabitants of in Zarahemla, mm -hmm. um, who are it's a Nephite city. Yeah. Um, and. I think we kind of have that like pyramid apex, right? Yeah. That's kind of leading directly up to Samuel. He's just in the, the focal point of our right. line of sight. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of, Freiburg kind of loosely has that, but this is much more pronounced. Um, yeah. And I think kind of really invites the reader into wanting mm. to hear what Samuel has to say because you can actually see him. Yeah, I think that's a great reading of the compositional elements here that makes Samuel the focus of this piece, whereas in the older one, the Freeburg piece, um, the focus is really more on the soldiers and the people who are trying to, to shoot him off the wall. And he's, like you said, just this tiny little 
like sort of almost abstract figure up on yeah. the wall. Um, but I like that the focus here is more on the prophet himself. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he has his hands raised mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. in that kind of typical Arant pose, yeah, um, yeah. preaching pose. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know about the cross hatching in the back, but to me it makes it look like maybe it's it's supposed to be dark potentially, mm -hmm. or it kind of, because he's prophesying about these celestial, you know, the stars that will mm -hmm. come and the darkness that will come at Christ death and the, anyway I just I wondered it kind of yeah. gives us to sort of pay attention to the skyline um, and maybe kind of foreshadow some of the prophecies that he's making about the changes in the the sky that will right. that will foreshadow Christ's birth and death oh that's really interesting I hadn't really thought about that but I think you're right that like Samuel is um, highlighted against the dark sky but um, yeah maybe the dark sky is there to remind us of his prophecies about Christ. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I also noticed here, we have these figures in the front. They're shooting bows and arrows, and they're slinging rocks up there. Um, but then there are a few figures towards the back of the group that are actually facing out towards the viewer. And some of them even have their hands raised. Um, and I, I, I noticed as I was reading the scripture that says, there were some people who did believe Samuel. And I wondered if that's what this artist is showing here is uh, some women and men that did believe and are um, reaching for Samuel and, and trying to protect him from this, this mob of, of persecutors. Um, and as far as I know, I think that's the only time I've seen that idea depicted in images of Samuel. I think that's so fascinating. Mm -hmm. I didn't even pick up on that because I didn't mm -hmm. see the picture big enough to even uh -huh. see those middle <laughs> figures mm -hmm. um, because they're not very well differentiated. But once you pointed that out, like I'm yeah. like, oh, of course, yeah. right? There are these these people who mm -hmm. aren't throwing things and aren't angry and do right. seem to be protecting him. Yeah. And um, and it does talk about in chapter 16 about the people who who believed Samuel, who went to Nephi, mm -hmm. who confessed their sins, who asked mm -hmm. to be baptized. Mm -hmm. um, and and could that be them, right? right? That he's, this artist is depicting both groups of people in Zarahemla. Yeah, I think to me, this just as an, as an art historian, I feel like this is a great example of how we can see the same scene over and over, even by different artists, but when it's always done the same way, we, we forget about these other parts of the story. And here this artist has carefully maybe read these scriptures and included that part of the story that seems to be left out of most of the other art. Yeah. yeah. So it made me think differently about the whole the whole scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now I noticed you um, you were also talking to me a little bit before we were recording about um, the composition and how it might relate to some of the 1920s interest in tableaus and, and stage settings. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, so the first time I saw this piece, it just, it looks so dramatic, right? Just the mm -hmm. way that the figures are positioned in this mm -hmm. pyramid with Samuel on top. Yeah. And and I, I know that the, the church, like many American communities, um, they would get together and they would perform tableaus uh, mm -hmm. where, where they would, um, you know, a group of people would get together, they'd have costumes and they would, yeah. you know, arrange their bodies in this, like maybe to look like a, a famous painting right. or maybe um, a historical event, like yeah. this Pilgrim's Crossing um, or yeah. something along those lines. And so it was a really popular form of entertainment right. in the early 20th century in America. And so it just seemed like that would, you could easily create this, uh -huh. right, in yeah. a primary class or even um, the Latter-day Saint community started performing pageants. And we have the Hill Camorra mm -hmm. pageant that starts in 1937, right. which is just, you know, a decade after this. Yeah. And the Samuel, the Lamanite, was one of the six episodes in the, in the first script. Oh, um, okay. That continued uh -huh. uh, until 2019. Um, so 1937 oh. to 2019 was Samuel the Lamanite was part of that pageant. Oh, that's fascinating. Wow. And, um, and then the more and Miracle pageant at Manti also included mm -hmm. um, the Samuel the Lamanite as one of the episodes that they also depicted. Yeah. Um, they have Samuel standing on top of 
a crenellated wall of the Manti Temple. Oh, wow. Okay. With a spotlight. <laughs> well, yeah, I, can, so. <laughs> I mean, I can kind of see that here, right? That kind of idea of this, this almost, yeah, almost like a staged moment of, of action. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's neat. Okay. Well, anything else you'd like to add or share a personal reaction to um, the artwork or these scriptures? Oh, uh, yeah, to kind of going along with this idea of the dramatic aspect and the tableau aspect. I taught primary for a couple of years, and um, it was kind of just after the transition to like doing primary as Come Follow Me. So, mm -hmm. you know, you didn't have a manual anymore. Right. You know, you're like, okay, you know, talk about these however many chapters of hard scripture with, I had six and seven year olds. And so yeah. it was this, you know, it was it was a fun pedagogical challenge to yeah. figure out like how do we make the scriptures come alive right. for children who are not really reading yet, and even if they are just starting reading, they mm -hmm. certainly can't read, right. you know, scriptural language. And mm -hmm. so I was always on the lookout for ideas to try to help them, um, like move their bodies and engage with scriptural stories in ways that they that would be memorable mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that I could I could have staged a tableau, <laughs> you know, of Samuel the Lamanite. Like I could ha ask one child to stand on a chair and be Samuel, and then either help the other kids, right. you know, be the the angry crowd, and some of the kids be the repentant part of the crowd. Mm -hmm. And then maybe switch up and like move the kids around and say, okay, how does it feel in these to be in these different positions? Like, what does it oh, yeah. feel like to be Samuel? What does it feel like mm -hmm. to be angry and like trying to hurt Samuel? What does it mm -hmm. feel like to be listening to Samuel? Hmm. And and how would that help them remember the story? Yeah. You know, by actually like moving their body in ways that they would they would say, oh yeah, I I I see myself as part of the story. Oh, what a great idea. Well, if you're listening out there <laughs> and you teach primary, I think that's a great idea or to do with just children at home. Yeah, yeah. family home evening. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Jenny.